Good evening, everyone. Good evening. You've tuned in to Paradigm Shifters, and tonight we have a true paradigm shifter from many, I would say, from many levels and many dimensions, and we're going to uh, have our own paradigm shifted, hopefully, in this discussion with you, Stuart Wilde, about, oh, I don't know, about 9-11, which is today. Today's the anniversary, and about the election and about banks, and about um, your stigmata, and everything else we want to talk about. So welcome to the show, Stuart. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I... Just getting ready for us? Well, no, I was getting ready for 9-11. I actually got up to pray for the farmer and the office workers that lost their lives, because they were so badly betrayed. I mean, 9-11 is a big con job, and everybody knows it now, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if everybody knows it, but reading your material, it sure is believable. PBS put out a show, did they? Yeah, PBS put out this show, and it's gone viral, and essentially it talked about the buildings being brought down by um, thermite explosions rather than by the impact of planes. And, of course, the other building, I think it was called World Trade Center 7, Mm-hmm. wasn't even hit by a plate, and it collapsed sort of later in the day. Wow. So these were demolition jobs. Wow. And so what would be the purpose of that? That was just to focus everybody? Well, I think it was a coup d'etat against the American people, because after that came the Patriot Act and the uh, Homeland Insecurity Department and arrests without trial and all these wars, you know, that were being, uh, being fought um, in the Middle East and the Far East, you know, on behalf of essentially the Israelis. I mean, you know, they're the people that benefit from like an, a one million Iraqi dead and the devastation of these various countries like Somalia, Yemen, and Afghanistan, and now perhaps Iran. Wow. Um, well, you know something, up. Stuart? You are uh, quite a wizard about seeing behind the curtain. Can yeah. you kind of give us a, like a global perspective on how you think it's all coming together, the power structures and so on? Because that's essentially what you're talking about. But there's a big Yeah, picture. that's it. I mean, look, essentially 9-11 was a sort of Zionist takeover of America. And there's a lot of very high up officials in the government in the White House that are Israelis with American passports. Oh, wow. And I mean, ever since 9-11, the whole thing has been sort of driven towards like helping Israel. I mean, you know, in America had no reason to go to war with Iraq, you know, and there were no weapons of mass destruction. And even the anthrax, you know, that they were sort of showing on, you know, the United Nations and that sort of stuff turned out to come from an American uh, military facility. So it was American anthrax that was being posted to American journalists. Wow. And so forth. So all these secrets have now come out and, you know, a missile hit the Pentagon and um, the plane in Pennsylvania was shut down. I mean, Rumsfeld admitted that on television. And then there was that plane that hit the towers that was not an American Airlines plane. It was a military plane with um, bombs and pods attached to its underside. Mm. And so, essentially, we've been looking at a kind of takeover of America. I mean, America's been infiltrated and captured by a foreign power. And, um, do you really think so, or do you think that there's a global... Uh, this is what I often feel. No, no, it's global. It's global yeah. as well. It's not just America, because, I mean... But it's not just know. Zionist. It's also... Uh, isn't it? Isn't there a global elite that takes over? Yeah, I mean, the Illuminati, is sort of people like David Icke and so forth, um, tend to call them, are, are essentially the bankers and the aristocrats and the Zionists and any other supremacists that you might fancy. So... There is a sort of, you know, I mean, the elite profit from the working classes and from the markets and so forth because they have insider information. But essentially, the whole thing is really all about the sort of um, rule of the Zionists and Israel, you know. So, you know, I mean, I'm sure the British monarchy is subjected to the Zionist cause, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that's kind of, uh, it leaves me nonplussed, but I'm going, okay, so here we're having an election. And I, I sort of chuckle because I think it's a ruse, is it not? Isn't the election kind of a pretend Well, it's thing? nonsense because, first of all, the elections are fiddled because the diebold machines can be altered. Right. The electronic voting machines. Mm-hmm. So those machines will um, vote for whomever the authorities decide they want. So in the end, it's really a choice between Romney and Obama, and um, which one is more Zionist, because if so, they'll get chosen. 
and so it doesn't really anything to do with people voting. And um, and but you were saying something in one of the blogs I read or one of the articles that you felt that uh, Obama's relationship to Israel was huge. That he had a huge Jewish connection. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, he's completely like a sort of Jewish patsy. Hmm. And so it's not about his being law. black or anything. <laughs> no, 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 because they're anti about. <laughs> you know, okay, they don't think he's even American. I mean, there's all these stories on the internet that his uh, birth certificate is fake and so on. Mm-hmm. No, no, I mean Obama is a, is a Muslim, but he's uh, he's essentially uh, you know takes his orders from 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 Israel. So, I mean, that's why let's say Carl Levin brought in the address without trial law and so forth. It's to protect the elite for when the citizens of America rise up. And are we going to do that? Well, you are, because some of the states are going to leave the Union. And some of the states are even talking about, you know, mounting militia armies and buying tanks and that sort of stuff to protect themselves from the federal government. Mm. And the federal government's buying a lot of of ammunition, too. We keep reading that. Yeah, so there's a war going to start eventually, you know, inside America. But eventually, uh, the Confederacy will join together, and they will attack the, the federal government. Hmm. So, but I guess you of... don't know time frames. No, but you know the collapse isn't that far away, and um, nobody can tell you, hey, the markets. I don't think the market's going to collapse before the election. But you know, after the election, anything could happen. You know, there could be like a Gaia hit, and mm-hmm. let's say, for example, an earthquake in California, or a meteor hits New York, or some slow solar flare takes out the satellites, or if there's eruption in the ionosphere, mm-hmm. then um, the the particles of the ionosphere go through the North Pole, through the body of the planet, and they come out at the South Pole. Now, if they go rushing through those poles, the ice will melt in just a matter of hours, maybe days at, at the most. So then the seas will rise 10, 15, 20 feet all around the world. And most of the cities of the world are on the water, on the water's edge. And so you could see some sort of catastrophic hit mm-hmm. that um, that may take the markets down. Because right now, I mean, Bernanke can print as much money in secret as he wants, and he can pump it into Wall Street to the big banks like Rothfellers, you know, um, Rothschilds, Oppenheimer. Warburgs, uh, you know, Brown Brothers, Harriman, Goldman Sachs. He can shove it in there as much as he wants and hold the market up, you know, because nobody in their right mind is buying stocks and and the big, big uh, mutual funds or unit trusts, as they're called in England. I mean, they're selling stocks and Soros sold all these financial stocks. Yeah, I was reading reading about that. Talk a bit about the uh, banks and and the big names dropping their own. Yeah, so he sold all these financial stocks and uh, bought 100 million. $130 $130 million worth of gold. Just all of a sudden? Well, I don't know whether he decided on the trade five minutes before or three weeks before. You know, I don't know. But, yeah, the trade is all of a sudden because you just put the trade in and it's executed in minutes, you know. Wow. So that's a little yeah. bit like a polar ice melt. Polar <laughs> ice melt for Mr. Soros. So yeah. the fact is that this whole sort of Illuminati thing, it's definitely real. But essentially, it's mostly just a Zionist takeover of the various countries of the world, you know. Mm. And, uh, and I don't think Canada's any different. And the United States, England, Germany, I mean, all these countries are subjugated to this um, this new sort of regime in Israel, which, you know, seeks to go to war and it wants to attack Iran and so on. But the Why do they want it, that? Are they just trying to take over the world? And what's left of the world if everything collapses? Well... I don't know. I mean, I, it's really hard to understand what uh, Netanyahu and these people are thinking because they're not going to get away with an attack on Iran without getting hit. Mm-hmm. Because Iran's got 10,000 missiles. Now, yes, Israel think they have a missile shield and so on. But, for example, the Patriot missile, mm-hmm. which was sold to the American people at vast amounts of money. I think the first order for the Patriot missiles was $180 million. Mm-hmm. The Patriot missile has never hit another missile in the air, ever. They've run endless amounts of tests, and it's never succeeded in hitting an incoming missile or an incoming rocket. But they're still selling them. They're selling them. (laughs) They're selling them. The Patriot Missile Defense Shield. I mean, you might as well just get an air pistol and fire it off your balcony. (laughs) It'll be just as good, you know. So the idea that Israel's building a shield against the Iranian missiles may be accurate. I'm not a military person. I don't think anyone has to be the biggest load of cobblers 
in the world. But they're against Iran developing a nuclear bomb. But um, here's what's very weird, is that when the Russian Empire fell at the time of Gorbachev and Perestroika and so forth, mm -hmm. and it ended, hundreds and hundreds of nuclear bombs went missing in Russia. Oh, wow. And the reason they went missing was because lots and lots of generals sold the bombs. Now, where did those hundreds of bombs go? So I don't think Iran has to develop a nuclear bomb. They can just go to Brussels, which is the center of the global arms trading industry, and they can buy as many bombs as they want. <laughs> you know, so this whole business of like the developing nuclear arms is nonsense. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. And then the theory is that Iran could produce four nuclear bombs in two years' time. But Israel's got hundreds of nuclear bombs. So why would they attack a country that's got like 196 more nuclear bombs than they've got? I mean, it's mutual insanity. It is insane. So the whole thing about the attack on Iran is sort of, I don't know, it's more megalomania and ego trips than, than, than it doesn't make sense. And Israeli generals have been quoted on, on the Internet and so forth and in the news as saying that attack on Iran would be disastrous. So... Well, the politicians aren't all stable, are they? Well, the thing I was thinking as you said that is that there are people who are megalomaniacs, and then there's a lot of, like, real people. Some of them are even in the government who don't want that kind of thing. So there's, like, no, a, a real I mean, split they in every and, level. You know, yeah, 50,000 people in Israel marched in the streets about a month ago protesting against um, working conditions and their government, and they don't want war. What do they need a war for? They've already you know, been through that. They've been through all these terrible times. What do they need to do it again for? Well, Stuart, I know that you're extremely conscious, and I feel like you're, uh, I know you're a wonderful healer, and a lot of us are in metaphysics and New Age and so on, and we've been talking about the shift for a long time, the 2012, the Mayan thing, and a lot of us felt like the shift was going to be like really positive and releasing us to being more conscious as a species, and everything that we're reading lately, I'm going. The shift is going in a different direction. It looks like the big foot of Monty Python is about to whack the planet. <laughs> Does that well, make sense? Well, my old teacher said 35 years ago that when the fascists come, which he saw 35 years ago, he saw them coming. He said that then the feminine spirit and the eternal Tao would become ever more prevalent in people. Woohoo! So the global consciousness raising and the fact that people are becoming more sensitive and softer and more spiritual through their various practices, whatever they do, meditation and so forth, is, and is, uh, is, is happening because the evil's there. In other words, the evil's over there on the right, and they're bringing up the celestial light on the left. And so our ability to transcend and to see and to learn extraordinary things uh, beyond anything that could have been possible in the past is only here because the evil's here. All right, so from another, I, I, I agree with that. So from another perspective, uh, I've been involved in the oneness blessing thing, you know, going around the world. But you wrote about the force, and I haven't read the book, but I read about the book. And is it so that there's a rising, uh, like you talked about, what could set the polar ice caps into melting fast and so on? Is there a rising consciousness stream coming through as well, which... We might lump under the force or the oneness thing or whatever. Yeah, no, no, no. There's no question that from the inner world, there is this, there is this vast supply of golden light with all the information that's contained in it. So it's not just a sort of sweet, cheesy light that's shining on you. It contains information. So people are vastly more connected than they ever were. And the shift is already happening. People are clicking to new ideas and new ways of living, for example, um, I don't know, becoming vegetarian, say, for example. And they're looking at entering into another dimension or another realm of consciousness. So you can have all this stuff going on outside, and you can have the stormtroopers marching down the streets. But and the Zionists. it's irrelevant if you're one and at peace with yourself and you're sitting in the forest. You see, so you don't... And you think concurrent realities that we can be living um, a wonderful and expanding consciousness whilst we're in the same environment as the 
megalomania is going yes, on? Yes, I mean, but on an internal inner world, you know, for example, like an ayahuasca journey or something like that, you know. Yeah, talk you about that. In... I've never done that. Talk about oh, that. Oh, you should, you should, you should. <laughs> there's Maybe. life before ayahuasca and there's life after ayahuasca. And once you take ayahuasca, most of the concepts and all of the books go out the window, including Stewie Wilde's books, because <laughs> um, ayahuasca shows you the real thing. Now, what, and when you, I was reading that you said that if we woke up through, for example, ayahuasca to what, what kind of karma we were creating or what kind of darkness and perpetrations we've done on the planet, a lot of people would just go mad. Is that right? Well, yes, because you see, the people that would go mad are the people that haven't looked at themselves. So the people that are wandering around there all sort of fat and bloated in their pomposities and their denials, mm -hmm. they don't see the degradation of their life. But if you've worked on your shadow and you're soft and sensitive and you look at who you are and you're willing to admit to your mistakes and your crimes and so on, you wouldn't go mad because all you'd be doing is essentially just processing the shadow. But most people have no idea what the shadow is or the need to kind of look at it and ameliorate it and process it and become a, a different person. Make peace with it in some ways too, eh? Yeah, make peace with it because in a way your shadow is your protector because once you integrate it, you become vastly powerful. So once we learn our, uh, for example, our killer or uglier instincts, and then we make a, a conscious balance, you think that's where, where exactly. the shift happens? Yeah, and I tell people, do the forgiveness prayer. And you do that on your knees when your nose on the carpet for 30 days every day at the same time. And you begive, for, beg forgiveness from your God or gods or the saints or the celestial beings for the crimes you've committed in this lifetime and all the time when you've been spiteful or you've delivered false witness or, you know, all the usual stuff, you know, judgment, pomposity, etc. And the strange thing is that as you start that forgiveness prayer, doing it every single day, by about day three and day four, you think you're going to run out of things to, to beg forgiveness for. And in fact, they all start to come flooding into your mind. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and you sort of remember how you stole sort of Sally Higgins' pencil box when you were six and so forth. <laughs> So you're recommending you do that for 30 days, and it's like... For 30 a... days. Can I take one second break, please? Please. Can you cut it in? Okay. okay. I just want to remind everybody to check StuartWild.com because he has a list of books, articles, YouTubes. I mean, really stunning material. I stayed up one whole night and just really went through his stuff, and boy, talk about uh, a shift. It really wakes you up. Yeah, you do it for 30 days, and you have to be humble, and you have to seek forgiveness. You can't just do it as a charade or as a performance. you got to be in your integrity, right? In your yeah, truth. integrity, and you've got to want to improve yourself, you know? Well, tell us about Stuart Wilde. Like, you've been at this uh, teaching us for 30-odd years, is that right? That's right, yeah. And how did you get started? Were you always, like, really conscious? My mother gave me a book. Um, her father was a medium, like a spirit medium. Oh, really? Oh, great. And she gave me a book called The Powers That Be, and I got interested in the sort of hierarchies of angels and saints and perception and ESP, and I yearned to be free. I mean, the essential theme of my life is how do I get free and how do I bring millions of people with me? And that's essentially what I write about. I write about aligning to the light and becoming free. Mm -hmm. And, um, but also you write a lot thing. about not being bought by the illusion or bought by the, the media presentation or whatever, right? Well, you've got to be careful about the media because, you know, the same Zionist forces that own America, own and control America, control the regular media, you know, NBC, ABC, CNN, and so forth. So politically, they're not going to give you a straight line. And then the rest of the time, they're trying to sell you something, which is nothing evil in that. Mm-hmm. Because they've got to make a living, but at times you've got to come out of consumption mm -hmm. and come out of defining yourself. There was a lady the other day at dinner who is Jewish, and she was talking to me about the second Holocaust. And I agreed with her about the fact that it's coming. And she said, well, what do I do? And I said, look, give up, give up on being Jewish. Give up on Israel and the Holocaust and all that malarkey. Give up on calling non-Jews goyim, which means cattle. And I said, be humble and be soft. And go within, you know, and give thanks for small mercies. I mean, don't be I defended. Told, yeah, I told her, listen, you don't want to be a Jewish woman. What you want to be is a celestial eternal woman. Yay. And then you'll, accept, you'll escape all the fates. You won't be there, you know, that you won't be there. One of my readers was in Bali on holiday with her husband and her daughter. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And um, she was in a cafe, disco place kind of thing. And she popped down the road with her kid to just wander about the shops. And the place blew up and her husband was killed. Oh, no. Yeah. In the Bali bombings. And um, that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's almost like when the fascists come down your street, they'll make a wrong turn and go up the next street. Mm. Once you develop that celestial self and you go beyond the definitions and you're no longer, you know, you're no longer a Hare Krishna or you're no longer Jewish or you're no longer Presbyterian and you're not campaigning for this and angry about that, you enter into a softness. And by being soft and compassionate to all people, Jews and non-Jews and every single race, creed and color in the world, and being by being soft and kind to the animals by, say, for example, embracing vegetarianism, you develop a compassion in your heart for the pain of humanity. Mm. And once you get to that point when you can recognize their pain and you can have a compassion for them and you attempt to add value to their lives when you meet them, not necessarily giving people money, but just being there for them, Mm -hmm. you gradually detach from the fate of the world because the fate of the world is disastrous because it's so hard and cruel. Mm -hmm. But once you go the opposite way, it's almost as if like you drop out of the matrix you're no longer cruel, you're no longer hard, you're no longer jingoistic, nationalistic, socialistic, blah, blahistic. You drop all that stuff. You know, don't define yourself in any particular character. Be eternal. Hmm. And that's what I told that woman at dinner. You know, be eternal. And once you're eternal, you're safe. And could she accept that? Yeah, I got, I got the feeling she got it, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. She seems kind of a sort of conscious, advanced person. So tell I me about could... multidimensionality. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the the way you're talking, I'm going... Well, do we then, are we capable then of really shifting dimensions and being in a different... Uh... Okay. Spiritual growth has a lot to do with going sideways, not up. So you don't go up towards God, you go sideways towards God. Oh, okay. And the more evolved you are, the wider and wider and wider you are. Now, a person that's very restricted and controlling and dogmatic and sort of stubborn in their ideas is narrow. I mean, and then as you open up and you're more accepting... You go wider and wider and wider and wider. As you go wider, yourself, your identity, your etheric field actually starts to blip into these other dimensions, the nearby dimensions. Mm. Like, say, for example, the lunar mirror world. Now, the lunar mirror world, and lunar means of the moon, is just in front of you. It's a dimension that is between your um, elbow and your wrist when you have your arm pointed straight out. It's halfway between the two. And in that lunar mirror world is what we, what the New Ages used to call in the olden days the spirit world. Hmm. And that spirit world has heavens and hells and dimensions and limbos and beings and devils and mystical animals. And So by going sideways, you start to penetrate these other dimensions and you begin to see in your visions more and more and more of realities that are not three-dimensional and some are four, five, eight, ten you know, however many dimensions. Of course, the further you go away from 3D, the less you understand it because those men- those dimensions are inverting and converting, so they turn inside out every second, mm. and they're going from south to north and east to west are changing positions. Mm. And so in those other worlds, it's very, very hard. You can't tell whether you're upside down or not because there's no horizon. How, how do you get into them? you have to take ayahuasca, or can we do this as a growth thing? You can do it by demeditation, but you have to develop that softness I talked about. Okay. Because it's the hardness in people and their vengeance and spite and their yearning and all the stuff and the supremacies and the, you know all that stuff that we talked about. It, that's what keeps them narrow. So you have to be very soft, and you have to let go and let down. You know, let the energy come to you. Well, then if you, if you want to take ayahuasca... I mean, I've been a great promoter of ayahuasca because it's sort of the number one transcendental tool in the world. But I understand some people don't want to take it and it's too sort of out there and extreme. But but you can do it through meditation, through softness and through discipline as well. But then ayahuasca gives you a massive boost if you are willing to, you know, find a place and go to it. Hmm. Uh uh, you are, I'm jumping around because there's so much that you can talk about, but uh, yeah. your visions, you, you've had stigmata for people who don't know those. That's the replication of Christ's woundings from the crucifixion, right? Yeah, I've had this, yeah, what happened was this, about two and a half years ago, I was at my apartment in Vancouver overlooking the um, Falls Creek, mm-hmm. and this light appeared in the room. I saw it approaching for about an hour, and then it appeared in the room. And it was going round and round and round the room, strobing like um, 
like a sort of disco light. It was about the size of an NFL football, mm -hmm. and it was going whoosh, 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 whoosh all around the room. And there were four other people there, and they saw it. Hmm. And uh, and then I went through some processes which I don't necessarily want to talk about here. But and then I saw Jesus several times. And then at the end of all of that, which was about four or five hours, that the light was moving around the room. I had the sensation of a skewer going through my feet, oh, wow. my right foot, and I had terrible difficulty going to the bathroom. I had to crawl on my knees and hold my foot off the ground. Oh, wow. and, and that started two and a half years ago, and it goes, it's in my feet and it's in my hands, and it's been going nonstop almost for two and a half years. Wow, has it I hurt have a it lot? Right now. I have it right now as I'm speaking to you. Oh, dear. But from that light came... Uh, from from that stigmata came a lot of light in my hands, and I could see the light in my hands in a darkened room. And I could show it to other people, they could see it, and I could see the light in my hands with my eyes shut through inner sight. And then I saw visions which suggested I should go and put my hands on people, you know, and console them or offer them a spiritual blessing or an internal healing of a physical problem. And so for the last few months, I've been doing that, you know, and... I do a lot of them in the street. I don't accept donations, and the healings are free, and I just rock up with two stools in the street somewhere and do whoever happens to be there. It's, it's kind of fun, but it's kind of quirky as well. <laughs> Quirky's good, isn't it? Yeah. So let's jump into the money thing. Um, not about you and money and healing, because I think we kind of understand that, but as the banks break down and as we become go sideways, as you say, and so on, can we do without the money thing? Uh, can well, we? It's, I suppose it depends, you know, what your level of commitment is and whether you have children and school, school fees and medical plans and pensions and all that stuff. But all the pensions will be wiped out, completely That's wiped out. That's what I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the best thing to do is to put your pension in gold. And I believe that's legal. I've been told it certainly is legal in Europe. I imagine it would be legal in America. Because the stocks and shares and annuities and stuff aren't going to be there. I mean, the life insurance company is not going to be there by the time you want to cash in your annuity. So that's one thing on money. But what's, what about the is, reality, for example, in British Columbia versus in America? Is it going to be steady there and not here? Or is it all over that it's going to be the same? I think the collapse is going to affect every single nation in the world. Okay. But there are societies like British Columbia that are more equitable and kind and they're less harsh on their people and um, I mean driving around Vancouver for two or three days I mean I've seen a couple of cop cars but that's it but I mean if this was any major American city there'd be tanks in the streets and police in black uniforms I mean there'd be stuff everywhere you know yes so it's just not the Canadian mentality to sort of enforce this sort of macho trip on the citizens. Or have guns. And, and have guns and stuff like that. This isn't really a gun-carrying country. No. Um, but, and but, so I but, just think the British Columbia would be way, way safer in any sort of collapse or hard times or whatever, you know? I guess what I'm really asking in, at another level is um, if we go sideways, if we can have that access to what I'm calling the multi-dimensions or if we can get in the flow of, what, the force or the um, new streams, do we have to be using money the same way? Or do, do, can we manifest? Well, the thing about can it is you have to use it while it's still there. You, you have to use it while it's still there. Right. But, I mean, there's no question. You you can't give your landlord sort of 25 cabbages, you know, for rent. And stuff. <laughs> but the point about it is, what I tell people is this is, you have to become emotionally detached from your stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when you become emotionally detached from the stuff, you know, that entire garage full of garbage that you're never going to use, right. then have a garage sale and get rid of as many things. Get rid of your debts, get rid of all the stuff that's superfluous, you know, downsize from a fancy car if you have one to a small car. And essentially get down to where you're traveling light and you can leave if you have to. Right. Okay. And that's the main thing because once Wall Street collapses, you know, America will become a very difficult place and... Uh, so uh, I think people have to sort of like, you know, divest themselves of all the encumbrances that they have, you know? Uh, I so agree. Like, golf's fun, but there's no any reason to pay 50 grand for a golf club membership, you know? Just go pay the green fees once every so often when you want to play, you know? Right. So right. it's that kind of mentality of looking at all the stuff you don't really need, you know? But can you, do you have visions? I know you have like hundreds of thousands of visions. Do you yeah. have visions of us being able to go through the collapse and come up as an uh, emerging species that's kinder, that's gone sideways, if you will? That's uh, Yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. You know, we're going to save the children. 
We are. And take them through this doorway. Um, the celestial worlds, if you hold out your hands right and left, the celestial worlds are at 90 degrees from us. So at the end of your right hand is a celestial doorway. There's another celestial doorway when you're facing north. If you imagine north, northeast, which is halfway around from north to east, and if you take your hand up 45 degrees above the level plane and point, there's a celestial heaven up there. Mm -hmm. So these are vectors or dimensions. I describe dimensions in my books as vectors, mm -hmm. so they're directions. So those celestial doorways will open when needed, and hundreds of people and children will go through. And they'll just go through to, the, to a different world, which is the same world. So in other words, they don't leave the planet and zoom off to Pluto or something. They just walk a matter of a few yards, and they enter into a dimension that is in a different time era of this one. Different reality. Well, it's a different reality because it'll be a golden kind, soft reality. But it's, a, it's not actually anywhere different. It's like, so let's say you're walking down a main street right. and you walk through this doorway. Well, on, another, on the other side of the doorway, there's no traffic and buildings and people. There's just green fields and mountains and flowers. Do you follow me? Yes, I do. But that dimension is actually on Burrard Street in Vancouver. Do you follow me? I see, yeah. You see, you're actually walking into a time zone when Vancouver doesn't exist anymore. So it's concurrent uh, realities, right? In the current reality, you're moving in, let's say, 160 years from now, uh -huh. when there are no buildings and trees and cars in Vancouver, and it's all green fields. Hmm. Well, that's yep. really... So tell me about death. What What is death? Well, death is just, you know, when you leave... I mean, the body is very transitory. It's, very, it's a very short, temporary experience. Mm -hmm. And then when you die... You, you, your concentration moves from your physical body to this lunar world. And in that lunar world, you have a doppelganger, a double. So that doppelganger or that double is essentially your human soul, and it collects information via your subconscious mind of whatever impulses and feelings you have. So you wind up in this other dimension instantly. And in that lunar world, there are doorways and pathways to the hell worlds, to the limbos, to the heavens, and to other multidimensional experiences. And you can so choose those that, doorways? I'm sorry? You could choose that doorway? It's sort of chosen by you through your feelings. Do you follow me? Okay, yes. So if you're deeply fascist, you'll sort of choose the doorway with the swastika on it. Oh, my. <laughs> but if you're not deeply fascist, you'll attempt to choose some different doorway. If you try to pick a doorway that's very high up, you know, that's very celestial, and you don't have that very celestial energy, but you're quite celestial, mm -hmm. that doorway will deny you. You'll attempt to go down it, and it won't let you in. Hmm. because your energy is not congruent with it. So essentially it's self-selection, but there's nobody judging you or wagging their finger at you. But it's the but same it, idea where you're choosing to be softer, is that right? You're choosing yeah, to Yeah, you choose softness, release. you choose kindness, you choose compassion, you choose, you know, non-judgment as much as you possibly can. And then, I don't know, if you swear the taxi driver that splashes your dress, it's fine, it's no big deal, do you follow me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it just seems interesting to me that if you're going to m meet one of these vortices and going into a different consciousness, and that and death seem very similar, are they not? Well, death is yeah, a little bit more... Yeah, it's exactly the same. You see, I believe that people, the humans, will be able to walk across with their bodies. You know, they'll go through a transformational change, oh. and the body will become less solid, but but it'll reform on the other side. So essentially, I think people can walk out of this world. They don't necessarily have to actually go through a death. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's so something they can so walk away if they want. Wow. So can you tell us something about, tell the listeners and me, actually, about uh, something we could do to aid this process? That you know, Well, of, it, it's Besides it's the just, forgiveness meditation, I did yeah, listen to that. Yeah, it's also that's incredibly simple that it almost doesn't sound like, you know, realistic instructions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you don't have to sort of prance around in robes and clank and bell and chant your arms if you don't so wish to. It's, it's really a matter of letting go. So you let go on all the dogma of who you are. You know, I wrote a, um, a little article on my site a couple of days ago called The Bureaucracy of the Mind. Okay. And in it, I was saying that um, the mind is like a sort of petty bureaucrat, a sort of government official. <laughs> and it's all pompous and pushed up and, and it has loads of silly rules. And if you let go of one rule today forever, one silly rule, and you realize how ludicrous the rule is, let's say, mm -hmm. then um, 
that frees you. That frees you from the insanity of who you are. Because essentially, all the pain in the world, the psychological pain, is inflicted by the humans themselves. And then the physical pain is, inflict, pain is inflicted by the, dem the demonic world, the ghouls. Talk a little more about the demonic world. Well, um, over 10 years, I became quite an expert because I found myself fighting down in those worlds. Oh, really? So um, I saw these cactus spines on my hand, mm -hmm. and I asked what they were for, and I heard point and shoot. And so I'd found a cactus, uh, the, the points of these needles, which appeared like a purple dot, actually. Mm -hmm. And I'd found them at the ghouls in the distance that I could see in the lunar world through trance. And so over the years, I fought tens of hundreds of thousands of millions of them. Um, what are they, just of, beings that are left? Uh, yeah, they're discarnate entities. So they're beings that died, or they're beings that are actually still here. Hmm. Now, some of the ghouls in the in the demonic worlds are, don't have arms and legs. Mm -hmm. The first thing that happens in there is they lose mobility, and so they lose their arms and legs. Mm -hmm. And so they're just an upper body and a head. So they don't move very fast because of that. And so they're easy to hit. And then there's other very, very high-tech ghouls that are like flying angels, you know, flying reptiles. Mm -hmm. And they're very, very, very fast moving. And then there's the UFOs are in there, and they're sort of demonic beings that can morph, so they're very high-tech. And um, so, there's, I mean, there's thousands of different entities in the in the ghoul worlds. Maybe ten thousand. There's other beings that are called we call the clunkers, because they look like they're made out of little metal parts, like like a, well, I don't know if they have Meccano sets anymore, but you know, the kids used to have those little things that they oh, yes. bolted together trains or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, they look like they're made of metal, and then there's other beings that are skeletons, they're the spirits of the dead, and then there's these sort of very strange beings that um, I call the cobweb beings because they have all cobwebs between their fingers and their limbs. Oh, wow. Um, and they're very tacky and, and, I mean, they're dirty. They're very dirty. And then in there, there's just humans. I mean, humans, pedophiles, gangsters, um, black magicians, and all the stuff that you find in the world. And um, a lot of the ghouls are just digital fractal um, beings that uh, have only just an upper body, but they snarl and they can spit. They sort of can fire a pulse on you. But the ghouls fire pain at humans because the ghouls are so full of hatred. Mm. And so um, a lot of human pain isn't anything to do with the physical body. If you break your leg, it's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times, the, the, the ghouls fire skewers at people, and um, people um, have, like, endless pain, low-grade pain, but endless pain. And... Um, I often in the street, I'll see somebody with a skewer sticking out of their head. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So you can perceive that. So yeah. again, can we learn to uh, avoid that or walk past yes, it? Yes, you not can. You see, again, you have to have this prayer to the feminine spirit, this prayer to softness. You know, humility is the key to everything. You have to be humble and don't pretend to be special or elevated or chosen or, you know, new age, you know, whatever, voice of God, blah, 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 all that's rubbish. <laughs> you have to be unbelievably humble and you have to pray to the feminine spirit, you know, Gaia, the spirit of nature, to the female gods, and you have to pray for their blessing to make you more. And then if you bath with lavender and you put lavender in your crown chakra and stuff like that, that will also help you protect you from the ghouls. Hmm. And Did then you have to resolve any interpersonal differences. I mean, you have to not have any rancor or vengeance or, you know, uptight with your ex-husband or whatever it might be, or your ex-wife. You have to let it all go. You have to forgive and forget and allow those people to go on. Even if you were treated most cruelly by them, you still have to love your tormentors and ignore it. So that's the 30-day uh, forgiveness routine that you were suggesting? or Yeah, and it's also looking at yourself and thinking, you know, noticing perhaps how stuck up you are. Mm -hmm. A woman came to a healing um, oh, a couple of weeks ago, and she told me that after her healing, her, like, ego collapsed, and she suddenly, like, around arrived at ground zero. But then she went on to say that it was the safest she's ever felt in her life. Because wow. once she gave up on the ego and all its demands and yearnings and needs and pomposities and stupidities and, and its spite and its stuff and stuff and stuff, then suddenly you're safe. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how you become safe in a world that's going nuts. And essentially, you get rid of, you get rid of the matrix around you by becoming soft. You can, you can destroy the matrix that's holding you in.
That sure makes sense to me. Through humility, through compassion, through softness, and not feigned compassion, not pretending, you know? Mm -hmm. You can't put on robes and wander around the New Age shop. I mean, you have to just be genuinely <laughs> humble. Oh, darn. <laughs> yeah. You have to be genuinely humble, Yeah. and you have to have a compassion for all the people, including the Nazis and including the gang members and the rapists and the bent politicians. And, and the Zionists. Yeah, and the liars and the this and the that. You have to have compassion for all of them, you know? Well, tell me this, Stuart. Do you think that this consciousness is waking up, this um, bringing the feminine, praying to the divine feminine, all these things you're saying, is that kind of contagious? And will that rise, will that awareness and that going sideways rise in even the beings who are running things and the bank people and the government people? Will it rise? Yeah, it's definitely contagious because... For example, I saw a vision of Jesus, and he handed me a purple ball. Mm -hmm. Again, it was an oval light, much like the very first light I saw when the light was strobing around the room in my apartment in Vancouver. And I passed that purple ball to an older lady who was standing next to me. And she passed the purple ball to a young teenage girl who then passed it on to others that I couldn't see. So the light is going around, you know, it's going around, and, and it's transforming the world. And in the end, it will collapse the power hungry and the greedy and it's going to collapse the system and will it heal the mother earth it'll heal the mother earth eventually when there are no more humans here oh dear that's a hard thing to say isn't it yeah well that's just it you know yeah and when when you talk about the force well i guess when we say everything's going to collapse people do get afraid but what you're saying to us today is that there are exit routines for us if we want to exit our ego-based or trapped or enslaved consciousness. Is that right? Definitely, yeah. There's loads of exits, you know. There's loads of exits. It's not, you know, the end does not mean... Um, the end, end, it, end. You know, it doesn't mean the end. It's just a renewal, but a renewal goes on with people and children and the earth is restored. But it's not, you know, the stuff that we have... It has to go because in the end we're consuming too much. We're killing billions of animals. With wars being nasty, la la la. You know, people are getting sick from eating too much and gluttony and, and so forth. And it's like all that has to end in the end. It has to stop. And what did you say? You eat eight days and then you don't eat two. Is that right? Yeah, that's what I did for a long time. And now sometimes I um, do like a nine day fast. Okay. So I fast for nine days. And, and uh, were you always vegetarian? I was vegetarian for eight years, and then there was about four or five years where I wasn't. And now I've been vegetarian for the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. I can't quite remember exactly. And, and then another question was about the force. I, I wondered if you have any more to say about that. I keep looking for Well, it's a dimension. It's a celestial light, and it's purple, blue, and gold. Mm. And it is completely chock full of information so you know if it was just a pretty light i don't think it'd be worth going for because after you would seen it you'd go oh, oh here it comes again <laughs> but the fact is it's massively full of information and it can show you how to dematerialize and transcend and so it it's essentially the gatekeeper of the escape route it's it's a gatekeeper to your evolution it'll quicken the cells in your body and help you heal. It'll give you information about where to go and what to do. It's the presence of these godlike beings in your life, close to your life. And so I could write an entire book about the light, but suffice to say that grace, it's full of grace, and grace is information. So people that don't have proper information or they have bogus information mm -hmm. are kind of like out of grace. You know, they're not full of grace, they're empty of grace. They're kind of locked down against it, aren't they? They're locked down against grace, and the information they get will always send them the wrong way, and they'll make mistakes. So, again, it's just all simple stuff. But you already wrote a book on the Force, didn't you? I did, yeah, but I mean, I could write an update to that if I wanted to, because I've seen so much more of it than I had when I first wrote the book in the late 80s. And um, tell me also about your visions, because your visions... I, Everything I've read says you're not actually predicting, per se, but you get these amazing wake-up visions. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not predicting the winner of the Kentucky Derby or something like that. But um, 
the visions I have are all to do with the karma and the destiny of the world. The first vision I ever saw was the destruction of Jerusalem. Hmm. And I saw that so clearly, and this being appeared to me. And she had this digital fractal golden wraparound eye that went back towards her ear. Mm-hmm. And in that eye, I saw the, I saw the, um, the bomb that, that takes out uh, Jerusalem. So I can predict the destruction of Jerusalem. I just can't tell you when it's going to happen. Can you do anything about, like, for example, when you see something like that, is there any way you can impact that so it could be changed? Yeah, it wouldn't be my position to do that because... Essentially, you're being shown the visions from these gods, you know. They're sort of like celestial beings. I mean, they're very high up in the pantheon of beings. And I mean, it's not for me to tell God to destroy Jerusalem or to not destroy it. Do you follow me? Just to, just to observe I don't think it. God is involved in destroying Jerusalem, you know. I think the Muslims are rubber march, you know, or the Russians, maybe. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, what about ETs? Well, the, 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 the UFOs are essentially very, very advanced flying beings, like flying fallen angels, and they can morph into any shape. In any patch of blue sky, there's 200 of them over you. And some of them are brown blobs, and some of them are walking sticks, and some of them are oil barrels, and some of them are triangles, mimicking, um, you know, the modern, you know, planes. And some of them are the classic UFOs, you know, saucer, saucer shape. And, um, but you're saying they're not really UFOs? They are unidentified flying objects, which are devils in the air. So oh. It's like the devil's air force, really. Oh, really? Yeah, they don't come from outer space or anything like that. What does come from outer space? Nothing, because of the distances. Well, that's sort of interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of us think that they're coming in, and there are a lot of them around they are going to help us. No, they're demonic beings, and they're tricky. Essentially what they want to do is possess your soul and to capture your life force and feed off your fear. Wow. Well, that's so, really encouraging. <laughs> anyway, one day I was in my office, and at the back of my office there was a little room, and there was a bed in there, and I used to go and meditate sometimes in mid-afternoon and put the um, the phones on answering machine, and um, I was meditating, and I saw one of those alien greys in the room standing like a few yards from my bed looking at me. And so with the force of my will, I went through its eye, like whoosh, and on the other side of its eye was a reptile. Mm-hmm. So the UFOs are essentially flying reptiles. And then I came out of the office in the street a little while later, and there was a 25 to 30 foot in diameter UFO over the office hovering there, and that was in Holland Park in London. Mm. And um, so you're essentially looking at drones. The, the, the ET, you know, buggy eye guys are drones, they're manufactured beings. Um, that are manufactured in these vast mechanical cities that exist in the hell world. They don't have a mind of their own. They only have a collective mind. And so if you see them, you can confuse them because they can't think analytically. So the thing to do is to say, listen, piss off. Tea with the Pope is at 4 o'clock. That's what I said once. (laughs) You know, piss off out of here. Tea with the Pope's at 4 o'clock. You're not supposed to be here. And they turned around and walked out. (laughs) <laughs> well, this is kind of a funny question. I, I, um, I'm curious is about the history of people on this planet. Like how many hundreds of, how long do you think we've been on this planet? And what do you think is the goal? Well, is modern it? man hasn't been here very long, like 30,000 years. Okay. Is when we first appeared in the fossil record. But because a human can dematerialize, and we, myself and others have seen humans dematerialize more than a thousand times. It's common, absolutely common, that somebody could completely disappear. So if a human can disappear, they can probably walk out of this world. And that also says that they can probably walk in. Ah. So beings, humans, could have developed in other dimensions in over trillions of years. Because one of the, um, the problems with the sort of what I call particle clang theory mm-hmm. says that like there was this primordial soup on Earth and then the Earth warmed up and all the particles clang together and they coded for proteins and DNA exactly at the same second Mm -hmm. and then they built more and more proteins and more and more DNA and they created a human eye let's say well all of that's very fine and dandy but the earth hasn't been around enough long enough for the particle clang theory to be sensible Mm. but if humans developed in other dimensions and let's say they're 250 trillion years old Mm -hmm. 
which is awesome to think about. Then they could easily walk in here to see as preformed humans. So you wouldn't have to have a particle clang theory. Whether you want to go further and say, well, some beings created the humans on an experimental laboratory, you know. Yeah, we've heard that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that faintly could be possible. I mean, I can't say it isn't. But the fact is that in these other dimensions, they would have existed for trillions of years before the universe was born. Mm-hmm. And the humans could have easily evolved in some way in those other worlds, and even perhaps even on other planets in other universes, and then walked into this world. So, And that would include the animals and everything else as well. So the sort of biological um, seeding of the infrastructure of animals and humans could have taken place quite easily in another dimension first, and then the giraffe walked in here. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. Um, do you think that we're, uh, going back to going sideways, do you think that's what we're here for as a species is to learn, for example, the flexibility of walking in, coming in from great histories? Are we, are I don't think it's a general learning for most people because most people are here to just comprehend simple things like, you know, relationships, family, kids, you know, job, money, honesty, dishonesty, you know, that sort of stuff. So they don't have the capacity to really comprehend something at a very high level. And many of them are so imbued imbued inside their dogmas and their beliefs that they can't go sideways because they'd have to let go of whatever religion they believe in or whatever tribal society they come from. And so essentially the humans are trapped inside the matrix and only softness and kindness and these things that I spoke of will allow you to escape the matrix. Hmm. It's, it's just so interesting. The other thing that I'm watching is so many systems are coming apart and there's such a revelation of the, of the swindling going on and of the corruption and the deception and so on. But I keep meeting people who uh, are living just a normal life and they seem very secure and everything's great. And I'm like, wow, I wonder if this is just a split reality. Well, um there is this unraveling going on because the global shadow is coming out. And um, so I think it's going to go more and more and more. And then again, people who are balanced and normal while well, they're living normal lives. Yes. We're almost to the end, Stuart. I've, you've really covered um, at least tidbits of an awful lot of material here, and I'm just so <laughs> grateful. Excuse me, I'm spelunking and coughing it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, tidbits of material you were saying? Yeah, I say this, you have covered wonderful tidbits of of your deep, your vaulted material, and I really Thank appreciate you. it, and I'm sure everybody else does. How can they get hold of you? And uh, Well, they can follow my work on stuartwild.com. Okay. It's my daily blog, and I, you know, I write teachings there and political stuff and whatever else. Um, and that's it. And um, I don't have any gigs or anything. You know, I don't have a center or a temple or an ashram or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So essentially, they just follow through the blog. The world is your temple. And one of the things I want to tell everybody is you've got a, a, a comment on your blog about a vision with, I think it's Jesus carrying a pig. Yes. yes. I love that. Can you finish by telling everybody about well, that? Um, I loved it. A woman drove 800 kilometers to my house in Australia to tell me at the end we would see an apparition of a pig in the sky upside down. Mm. And the following day, I mean, at first I didn't think much of it, but the following day I did actually see a pig outside my house in the sky. <laughs> it was like unbelievably long and big, you know, I mean, I don't know, 50, 60, 80 you know, yards long. And it wasn't completely upside down, it was slightly tilted on a diagonal. So the pig under Jesus' arms, it seems ludicrous, even blasphemous. Blas- blasph- I can't even say the word. <laughs> you say it for me. I think we know it's blasphemous, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but in fact, it's a way of saying that Jesus is custodian of the end. And in Revelations, it says that he is the beginning, Alpha, and he's at the end, Omega. And so the pig really represents Omega, like a soft ending when he picks up the pig and protects it. And um, he allows for a calm and soft and kind transition for humans. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Well, Stuart Wilde, it's been a privilege to spend uh, almost an hour with you, and I know everybody's going to really appreciate it. So thank you, thank you, and be safe as you keep teaching us all. 
Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. All right. And good night, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. And you can uh, email me, Veronica, at veronicaantwistle.com for feedback or suggestions for guests or even to uh, send a message to Stuart Wilde. Many blessings and good night, everyone. 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 Everyone.